Are you on there? All right, we're live. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Boy, what a full house today. Uh, blessed Sabbath to everyone here. Blessed Sabbath to everyone watching on the webcast. Glad you could join us today. Well, brethren, uh, let's start out uh, by singing praises to God. Let's turn over to page 211 and rise, and we will sing glorious things of thee are spoken. Page 211. Well, thank you, brethren. Uh, for our second hymn, let's turn back to page 182. A song we don't sing very often, but we're going to do it today. By the Waters of Babylon, page 182.
Thank you so much, brethren. For our third hymn, let's just flip over one page to page 183, and we will sing, Lord, I will praise thee, praise thee, page 183, and after which I'd like to ask Mr. Rick Shepherd to open with prayer. Now for the opening prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before your heavenly throne, giving you and your Son all the praise and glory and honor, Father. Father, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. We ask you that you inspire us speaking and open our minds and our ears to understand what we hear today, Father, in the sermon. We ask this all in our Lord and Savior's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rick. Wow, what a full house today. That's awesome to see. <laughs> well, brethren, I have a just a plethora of new prayer requests, so we're going to start out with those. Uh, this first prayer request is for Pamela Barnes. Longtime member of CGI Auburndale congregation is going to have knee surgery here shortly and is asking for prayer that all will go well, including her recovery. Please keep her in your prayers. That's Pamela Barnes of CGI Auburndale with knee surgery coming up shortly. Also, Rachel Ramsey, I'm assuming this is from the same congregation, uh, a daughter of a teacher colleague of mine, I'm assuming this is Pamela talking. Um, she used to work with uh, committed suicide along with her partner in front of their children. The Ramsey family needs our prayers, both the father and the mother. That's uh, Pamela's teaching colleague. Um, of Rachel are shocked over their daughter's tragic death. So please keep the 
Ramsey family in your prayers as they go through this most traumatic, traumatic circumstances. That's just, oh, wow. This next one's uh, for Cheryl Hong, longtime member of CGI Auburndale Congregation, also has been hospitalized in what is to believe to be sepsis, a blood infection from ba uh, bacteria. Please keep her in your prayers as she goes through this trial, uh, this trialsome event. She remains in the hospital as of now. Pray that she will be soon released. That's for Cheryl Hong longtime member of CGI Auburndale as well, dealing with a blood bacterial infection. Well, this one comes from Canada from Pastor Horane Smith. This is an update on Leland Jasper. Bernard Wilson uh, sent this update. Leland was recently uh, released from the hospital today after a successful, uh, it's a cancer surgery that Leland had. Praise be to God, I visited him earlier today. He was in good spirits. He said he was in much pain after the surgery, but has turned to the better as of Sabbath approach. This is dated December 6th. Loretta and family has expressed their sincere thanks for prayers uh, the brethren, Leland is scheduled for another surgery soon and more to follow. Let's, let us continue to pray for him and his very supportive family. Um, it's nice to hear some good news. Uh, praise be to God for that, but to also continue to keep Leland in your prayers uh, with the upcoming surgery and, his, and also Loretta, too, by his side. This next one's also from Pastor Lorraine Smith out of Canada. Um, it's dated December 27th. Ray Doyle, CGI Burlington, needs our prayers as he faces some health problems. He has done some tests and is awaiting results. Please pray for God's intervention that everything will be well. On this Sabbath day, we urge you to continue to take our, your petitions to God on behalf of those who are sick or may have other challenges in their lives and need, your, need our prayers. That's for Ray Doyle, CGI Burlington. Uh, he's facing some health problems. Okay, uh, these next three are, are, are more, more local. Um, this one's for Mike Alexander, who is with us today. So good to see you, Mike. He's requesting a special prayer for an upcoming surgery scheduled for next week. This will be an open heart surgery intended to fix his heart valves. Mike has had this done about a decade ago, but now has to have some new updated material installed and to replace the previous material. Please pray all will go well for him as he prepares for this operation. He will be in recovery for some weeks afterwards. Keep his family in your prayers, too, as they go through this tense experience. That's for our brother Michael Alexander having upcoming surgery next week on his heart. Uh, these last two prayer requests um, are kind of personal for our, uh, my family, too, as well. Uh, my sister, Sonia, uh, she will be having neck surgery on Monday. Uh, please, I don't have a lot of details on it, but uh, please keep Sonia uh, in your prayers as she goes uh, through this surgery. And then uh, my grandmother, uh, Judy Wilson, my mom's mom, uh, she fell and uh, broke her back. Uh, she's 86 years old. Um, it's not much they can do as far as surgery goes, um, but uh, she's just kind of got to heal on her own. But the, the main thing is the intense pain that she's going through right now. So uh, be so kind to take uh, Judy Wilson before God and ask for him to re alleviate her pain and, and heal her broken back too as well. 
That is all the new prayer requests that I have, brethren. I just want to thank everyone for your prayers, for those on our bulletin board, uh, and continue to ask you to beseech them. Thank you, everyone on the internet, too, as well. Uh, uh, every prayer and every voice helps. So with that, brethren, let's go before God and ask for his intervention. Majesty on high, eternal Father in heaven, we we humbly come before your throne. First of all, just have to praise you and thank you for all the blessings that you bestow upon each and every one of us, every physical and spiritual thing. Father, we have nothing without you. We are nothing without you. And we come before your presence asking faithfully through Jesus Christ that you would heal. I read off so many names, Father, so many different ailments, broken bones, broken backs, uh, neck surgeries, cancer. Uh, it was wonderful to hear a healing in there, and praise be to you for that, Father. Uh, we have heart surgeries coming up, so many different, different ailments, that, and cancer is just so rampant. Uh, we thank you for the healings, but we must put before you those people that, that aren't healed and, and that are crying out uh, to us, and we cry out to you uh, for them, and they're crying out to you as well, Father, those that... Uh, are on our bulletin board, those that are just in our hearts. Father, we submit them before you, praying for your mercy, praying for your love, praying for your help, your protection, your guidance, your strength, not only for those battling it, but those that hold their hands as they go, go through it and their families right by their side. We pray for your deliverance, Father, and we submit them into your hands and ask for your healing upon them for your glory, Father. Father, we continue to pray that you Line our will up with your will, and then always your will be done, and that your kingdom come. Again, we submit this prayer into your hands. We submit ourselves and all these things into your hands and ask it all in the name of and by the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, I have a few announcements. Okay, those hopefully, do you still qualify for a, those hope, oh, those hopefully, those hoping, okay. <laughs> those hoping to still qualify for a 2019 tax deduction need to have your donations postmarked no later than midnight December 31st. Uh, everything postmarked after that time will be considered a 2020 donations. Any questions concerning this, they can be directed to Michelle Collins. Um, we're getting towards the end of the year. I do believe the 31st is Tuesday. Also, there will be a Bible study conducted after services on January 18th. We will be continuing uh, in the book of Daniel. Those planning to stay should bring their own lunch. Drinks will be provided along with some snacks. That's January 18th. Uh, Bill will be continuing our Bible study in the book of Daniel. On February 8th, Wynn Skelton from the home office in Tyler, Texas, will be our special guest speaker. A potluck will follow services. Please bring enough food for you and your family and a little extra. Singles are welcome to bring drinks, desserts, or snacks. That's on February 8th. Uh, Wynn Skelton will be here from the, the home office. It'll be good to see Wynn again. Uh, we'll have a potluck after services. And that's all the announcements I have, so we'll have one more song before we get into the main message. So if everybody would grab your hymnals and rise, we're going to turn over to page 162, and we will sing The Mercy That Never Fails. Page 162.
Thank you so much, Reverend. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce, for some MIA news and our sermon, our pastor, Mr. Bill Watson. Good morning, everybody. Good to see so many of you here, and even our college uh, students are on break. Good to see Olivia here in our audience, and of course, my granddaughter, Sydney, all the way from NYC. Good to see her uh, here taking some break here back home in uh, Medina, Ohio. And welcome to all of you there uh, on the internet to uh, services here in Medina where we're enjoying some very unusual, I guess what you could say, global warming experiences over here. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, don't get excited. But uh, we have been uh, very warm, actually, uh, unseasonably warm. Frankly, I was uh, out running in the park the other day, and I walked uh, by a couple of elderly folk, and I got to watch that because I'm kind of getting up there myself. <laughs> but uh, I mentioned to them, these are not the winners I remember when I was a kid, and they both agreed. <laughs> they said they are not because I remember years ago, boy, I'll tell you what, we'd get 12, 15 inches at a pop sometimes dozens of times over the winter. I remember back in 78, 79, those winters there where I've got a picture of me jumping off the roof of my house into a big snow, uh, uh, snow drift, that's what it was. And Margie took the picture in such a way it looks like I'm hanging from uh, the uh, telephone wires <laughs> by my shirt, but I wasn't. It was just an illusion. But uh, at any rate, it was uh, uh, something this last week with uh, the weather that we've had. We were in the 60s, believe it or not. Even Pittsburgh got good weather. Amazing. <laughs> the home of the Steelers. But at any rate, I wanted to... Um, actually mentioned something as well, and that is to add Jean Kirk, our matriarch down in Columbus, Ohio, in her 90s. She fell and broke her leg, as I understand it. Uh, this is Pat Kirk's mom, and she's a longtime member of God's Church, going all the way back to the 60s, and uh, has been our matriarch down there in the CGI Columbus, Ohio congregation. So those of you on the internet as well, do add Jean Kirk to uh, your prayer list as she uh, convalesces. I don't have any update. This happened about, as I understand it, maybe five, six days ago. Uh, I was looking for an update before services here, but I did not get it. So we'll be posting those things, again, updates and so on, on our website at cgimedina.org. So those of you during the week, if you want to get updates, don't forget, uh, hit the website there You know, during the week a couple of times at least just to kind of keep you abreast of uh, special announcements, changes, and of course special requests for prayer as the week proceeds because uh, we try to keep that as current as we can and I want to tip my hat if I had a hat to Joetta Nicoletti <laughs> for maintaining that website the way she does. She really uh, hops along there and keeps everything abreast and appreciate that very much, uh, uh, Joetta. Okay, well I wanted to share some news here with you that I don't believe has been getting a lot of press, however it is in the press. But I don't think it's really been headlining, but I just wanted to bring to your attention some things, lest you get surprised. Now, this is from Forbes.com, the Forbes magazine. Many of you are probably familiar with that source. But it regards the, uh, the continuing uh, ongoing growth, development of what the Chinese are doing in the military uh, arena. Now, many of you are well aware of the fact of how China has pretty much dominated the South China Sea. They're building actually islands stationary islands, man-made islands, uh, and in essence, arming them. They're basically stationary aircraft carriers. That's what they really are. But they're islands. And for all intents and purposes, they're arming them now, and consequently, uh, even 
here probably a couple of years back, our, uh, what you could say, Admiral of the Navy at the time had mentioned that uh, it, back in 2017, as far as his professional opinion was concerned, the South China Sea is now under the control of the Chinese. And quite frankly, to get it unraveled or untangled from their control in many respects uh, would be a very, very hard thing to do uh, without getting a bit violent with them. And thus far, they've been behaving and not exercising any kind of muscle to uh, any degree, disrupting Japan or disrupting the Philippines, uh, except for maybe agitations and annoyances. Nevertheless, uh, the indication here that I have illustrates that they are ongoing in their aggression to develop, prepare for something, whatever they're preparing for. And of course, many of you are aware, I would hope, that this latest approval of the budget of a $1.4 trillion dollar U.S. budget that the United States just passed, again, more than half of that is earmarked for the military. So like it or not, uh, the current administration, the Trump administration, obviously is doing its best to try to stay abreast of the competition because we don't want to, at least as far as the secular world is concerned, get caught sleeping at the switch, as they would say. And a lot of this uh, is being driven uh, by China's development of ongoing artificial intelligence as well as even their dominance. I don't know how many of you are even aware of this. I haven't got to the article yet. I'll get to it. <laughs> but the artificial intelligence and the uh, ongoing development of satellite installations that China is very aggressively doing uh, while we speak uh, here. And needless to say, I think if the truth were known, some of that aggression is what's driving this new uh, segment of our military called the Space Force. You've heard of that, the Space Force, of which uh, Donald Trump's administration is attempting to try to get off the ground, fund, and begin to develop and grow it. And needless to say, with uh, what China is doing, and this article is going to illustrate uh, even more so, they're not letting up. They're continuing to push the envelope and continuing uh, to push, uh, obviously, the United States because they're in cahoots with Russia and they're in cahoots with Iran. So the fact of it is those three guys uh, are all in cahoots together and what's going on, you could throw North Korea in there as well because North Korea, for all intents and purposes, is indeed a satellite of China. But back to my article here that I have not introduced yet. Headlines, the Chinese Navy is building an incredible number, an incredible number, according to Forbes, an incredible number of war ships. That's W-A-R, war ships. While the U.S. Navy launches a handful of Agus or Agus destroyers, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that, I'm not in the Navy, uh, but at any rate, uh, I'll say Agus destroyers each year, Navy launches a handful, U.S. Navy, of these destroyers each year, the single image below, and I've got a picture here, an aerial picture that was taken out of an airplane that is illustrative of uh, literally dozens of warships under construction. It's amazing. And uh, the article goes on, the single image below of a Shanghai shipyard shows nine newly constructed Chinese warships, all in parallel, various degrees of construction. China's Navy, known as the Plan, parentheses, People's Liberation Army Navy, that makes sense, on parentheses, is modernizing at an impressive rate and on a vast scale. A key ingredient is the construction of a fleet of large destroyers, amphibious warships, and aircraft carriers. I go on quoting, these displace, and I'm not quite sure what this means, but based on the article, I think it means it's a pretty big boat. These displace 7,500 tons and can carry up to 64 large missiles, including long-range surface-to-air missiles, in other words, SAMs, and cruise missiles. The other two are larger types of 055 class ships. These are also described as air defense destroyers, but are verging on cruisers in terms of size and fit. These are at about twice the displacement and carry over 100 missiles. 
These are big ships, and these are not battleships. They're destroyers. Destroyers are smaller than battleships. Uh, it goes on here, the article, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of just cut to the chase here down toward the end. But the most impressive vessel is hidden in the background of this picture I have, uh, haze, barely discernible to the uh, untrained eye. Beneath several massive gantry cranes in a purpose-built construction area is China's next generation aircraft carrier. Now, they've already built a pretty big one, but this one is even bigger. China already has two carriers in service, but this new carrier is expected to be significantly different. Known as a Type 003, it is believed to have electromagnetic, electromagnetic, electromagnetic pulse catapults. You know what that is. If you haven't gotten familiar with electro EMP weaponry, you need to get involved. We have none that I know of ships equipped with that kind of technology. Other developments are not visible in the photo. I'm back quoting. It is the same shipyard where China's mysterious sailless submarine has been constructed. Although that submarine is not clearly apparent in the photograph, it may be present uh, somewhere else. I continue to quote, This image paints an interesting picture of Chinese naval modernization, yet the biggest takeaway is that this shipyard is not alone. This is only one. It's located in Shanghai, and it's got nine ships in parallel, in construction, in varying degrees, and it is only one location. It says here, there are many yards, many locations, many yards, shipyards, across China, which are similarly impressive. The Chinese Navy of today and the future is changed beyond all recognition from the Chinese Navy of the past. The world Navy balance is shifting to China. That's what it boils down to. As a matter of fact, Mike James and I just did a uh, recent web chat on artificial intelligence. And uh, through the course of that presentation, is, it'll be released probably next week, maybe the week after the latest. But in the course of that discussion, Mike and I uh, bring out the fact of how data is at the heart of, of course, artificial intelligence. Data, data, data. More data, more data, more data, more data. And the bigger and more data that you get, the more pronounced, mature, and capable your artificial intelligence becomes because that data can be processed faster than your mind. And so consequently, that's the key to artificial intelligence, where it can process faster, far more data. And right now, it's a known fact that China has about 10 times the data inventory than the United States. As a matter of fact, China, we bring this out in the program, I'll just give you a little preview, China is in progress right now to s install 600 million 600 million cameras and intend to have them all installed by the year 2020. When is that? It's coming up. By the end of this next year, they plan on having 600 million cameras installed so that there won't be any place in China you cannot go where you will not have a picture of you taken so that you can be profiled, analyzed, and be able to be identified through facial identity in milliseconds, which they're already doing. They lead the world in robotics. They lead the world in drones. Brethren, China is growing like leaps and bounds, quantumly, comparably speaking, while the United States had been basically, I'll use a simple word we all realize, circumcised militarily, if you know what I'm saying. For years, we've been giving it up, giving it up with old technology, and now, finally, re uh, revisiting some of that technology to kind of refresh it, but needless to say, we understand why, because the world is continuing to go ahead. Interesting, but nevertheless, uh, something that sadly and unfortunately in the world that we live in uh, is necessitated by the nations of the world. Because it isn't our world, is it? It's Satan the devil's world. But you and I basically live in a world 
that is indeed counterintuitive to what you are trying to develop inside of you. Each and every one of us, as I've often said, are in a program, a development program, to become kings and priests in the world tomorrow, but in a particular way, not dictatorially, not autocratically, not by being domineering in our leadership techniques, but rather differently, differently, counterintuitive to our nature that gravitates toward control, because we're all that way. We gravitate toward wanting things to be the way we want them, right? We're creatures of comfort. We tend to have this tendency to, to want to have lifestyles that suit us, habits that are comfortable to our way of thinking and or feeling and especially doing. We're control freaks in many cases because we like it that way. We don't like to be told what to do. And sadly, and quite frankly, that's a lot of the reason why God's church is a small flock. In Luke, we're told we're a small flock. At the end of Jesus' ministry, with all that he did, healing the sick, bringing limbs back into workable use, the deaf could hear. For three and a half years, he walked in a very closed environment just around the Sea of Galilee for all intents and purposes. And at that day of Pentecost, there were only 120 people, we're told in the book of Acts. 120 people and he was healing casting out demons walking on water he even raised the dead <laughs> and all he did was attract 120 folks and even at that it was slow going until of course that first day of Pentecost when they baptized 3,000 people but part of this brethren in all due respect as going back to the God's church and the reason why we're small People don't want God interfering in their lives. People want to do what they want to do. They don't want to sacrifice and give up their lifestyle, even if it is in counter, in counter ways of God's way, even if it is cutting across God's laws, His values, His standards. People don't want a God telling them how much to pay in donations. They don't want a God telling them what days to keep, what foods to eat, how to manage their personalities, how to manage their marital relations, what they can have sex with and what they can't have sex with. People want freedom, freedom of choice. And now our society, as you know as well as I do, has gone way off the rails to the point where they're even redefining what was considered normal. Now abnormality is being considered normal. Redefining everything in a postmodern world. I was kidding the other day. I was in a restaurant with, a, uh, with Adrian Davis, as a matter of fact, and uh, we were waiting there at the uh, uh, lobby, and I was with Jennifer, and I was standing there, and we were just kind of talking. The waiter was standing there by the door with us, and I said, uh, I, I think i got to go to the restroom. And she said, oh, okay. And I said, uh, there's a lady. I, think, I feel like a woman today. I'm going to go in. And I was just doing it for a joke. The waiter got the biggest kick out of that. He got the biggest kick out of that, and we started talking about our postmodern world. And it got him to talking about the fact, and believe it or not, he didn't like it either. He didn't like it either. He thinks it's confusing. He thinks it's counterproductive to relationships and so forth. So we're living in a world that really, in all due respect, has really gone in many re regards uh, to some extremes to the point where what we see here, and I'm going to turn to Book of Acts real quickly here, Acts chapter 2. This situation almost becomes now miraculous in the world that we live in. To get somebody driven to this point in the world that we're living in, brethren, is becoming harder and harder to do. And I say that from experience because the baptismal rates that God's church saw 
when I was baptized, you know, I was baptized with, I think, 14 people. 14 people. That's a lot of people to be baptized with. And that was only one baptismal session. There were multiple sessions like that throughout the year when I was in the Worldwide Church of God in the early 70s. That was the way it was. Baptisms have, at least from where I go and travel and so on, been told, have dropped off immensely, comparably speaking. Comparably speaking. To get to this point in Acts chapter 2 and over here in verse 37, now when they heard this, that is the audience heard what Peter said starting in verse 14 and then taking it all the way and for the sake of time I'm not going to reiterate or belabor his sermon. You can read that later. But the result, the result of his sermon, verse 37, is this. Now when they heard this, that is the audience that heard it, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them, repent, get baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Brethren, that is becoming more and more and more of a miraculous event in the lives of human beings in the world in which we're living in, and is becoming a rarity. I'm here to tell you. Small flocks, that's what we have today, for sure. Cell church program we have, the Church of God International, we, we now have about four of them throughout the United States identified. We're finding more and more. That's the cell program I was sharing with all of you with regards to many of you out there on the Internet who are now being contacted by Mike James. And this is a good thing because what we're trying to do is bring them together so that they can learn about each other because sometimes these people have people right around them they're unaware of. And now they're becoming introduced to each other, hopefully uh, being able to congregate together and uh, meet together in some local uh, or common area. But the point that I want to make is this is becoming harder and harder because this is the reason behind it. Over here in Romans chapter 8, I want to just draw your attention to this because this, brethren, is the battle. And each and every one of us that are baptized are involved in this battle. It is the greatest war in the world right now that is going on and has been going on since the Garden of Eden, and that is the battle of your nature. You, within yourself, the battling of your pulls, your desires, your proclivities, your inclinations of the flesh as it wars against the spiritual understandings that you have that you ought to be aspiring to. Paul articulates here in Romans chapter 8, breaking into the context in verse 5, he states this, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That is, those that think along these terms of always you know, self-gratifying uh, gra uh, their, their desires, whatever it may be. And I'm not only talking about sex. I'm talking about anything and everything. You, you just let your imagination go. Uh, you can figure out what it is about being the consumers that we are. But they that are after the Spirit, capital S, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, physically, materially minded, is death. Oh, I've got to worry about my hair. Oh, I've got to worry about the dress. I'm, oh, I've got to worry about the, uh, you know, the, the shoes. Oh, my high heels are not right. I've got to get another pair of high heels. Oh, I need a new car. Oh, I need a new house. Oh, I need a new job. No, I've got to make more money. You know, all these things. Always obsessing, always being preoccupied, always driving to consume and to get and to acquire. You know, people on the Internet today, oh, don't I, I'm posing. Yeah, yeah, don't I look good? You know? And they make a lifetime out of that stuff. They dance. It's just like, hey, it's all about me. They even kill themselves falling off cliffs in Grand Canyon, taking selfies, as they would say, trying to get their, you know, the best captured selfie that they can find. And they kill themselves doing these kinds of things. It's amazing, amazing expressions of vanity that are so off the rails that it's, it's just almost... Sometimes, if it weren't so sad, it'd be laughable to see how these people are taking to some of this. But they are. A lot of people are very infatuated with the physical, the material. And what Paul is saying here is, look, get a handle on it. You're here today, gone tomorrow. The real battle here is get some spiritual value in your life. And that's his argument. He says here in verse 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded, ah. That's life and peace 
And what he's talking about in the being minded is being inclined. That's your proclivity. That, that's where your priority is. Because the carnal mind, verse 7 now, Romans 8, verse 7, because the carnal mind is opposed. It's at variance with God. It's against God. Don't tell me when, when to go to church. Don't tell me when to go to a holy day. Uh, what do you mean I can't keep Christmas? What do you mean I can't keep Easter? No, you don't do those things. What do you mean I can't eat shellfish or pork or whatever it may be? No, I don't want that stuff. I, I, I got my own life to live. Why, don't you realize I'm, I'm a sovereign being? I'm human, you know. I'm a man. I'm a woman. <laughs> but, but people think like this. People think like this. And so here, Paul is saying, look, get it in, in perspective because the carnal mind is at variance with God for it is not subject to the law of God and neither indeed can be. Things about God is foolishness to most people that are still in the carnal state, that are still on a material level, that are still preoccupied with the physical and are driving themselves to obtain more and more and more, and that's all they live for. They are, as far as God is concerned, out of the loop. They're clueless in so many regards and in so many ways. And he goes on, verse 8. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you Christians, that's what he's talking about now. He's writing to the Christians in Rome. But you are not in the flesh. And I've often said, now we know we're in the flesh. What Paul's about to do is he's shifting into figures of speech. He's talking spiritually here. He's talking about your new inclination. He's talking about how you should be focused in your mind, in your outlook, and the worldview you should have. And he says here in verse 9, but you are not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. If so, be, and I got that underlined, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. You got to get baptized. Got to get baptized. I mean, you, you might think that you're, you know, you've got God on your side and so forth, and God does work with people on the outside, working toward the end, because God, that's how he calls. The Father calls us to Christ, and externally, God does indeed work with us, no doubt about it. But ultimately, the relationship needs to advance to where Christ in you, Christ in you has to be accomplished so that God can now intimately abide and make his abode with you and work with you from the inside out. That's important, and that's what Paul is saying. There's a reason to be baptized, certainly, and that is so that you can be truly considered his. Verse 10 now, and if Christ be in you, there's the point I was trying to make, the body is dead, figuratively speaking, because of sin. And that is true because Christ died for us. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11, but if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal, not immortal, mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwells in you. There again, a perfect reason for why you should want to be baptized because ultimately you need that trigger. You need that igniting, what you could say, um, strike of allowing God to be able to use His Spirit to trigger your change from flesh, mortal, to spirit, immortal. You're not immortal, brethren. So many Christian organizations today, especially in the traditional Christian community, believe you're already immortal. When you die, this soul waps off to heaven or waps off to hell. Or if you're Catholic, you get caught in the middle and hopefully enough relatives will pay you out of purgatory and you'll be able to get to heaven, you know. <laughs> and that's the way the game pl is played in, in so many respects. But the reality of it is that's not true. The Bible says, look, you've got one of two choices, life or death. And God says, choose life. Choose life. That's what he talks about in Torah. Choose life. And how do we choose life? We choose life by repenting, repent, repenting and accepting Jesus as your Savior, Messiah, and commit your life to him. And Paul goes on here, and in so doing, you're going to find yourself in this conflict because he says, he goes on here, verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors, 
we are debtors, I'm sorry, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. That's done. It's over. I'm not going back to my old ways. You're not going back to your old ways. Those ways are gone. So therefore, the more distance I can get, the more time I can get between the way I was to the way God is leading me to be, the easier, hopefully, it becomes as time goes on. Not always, because sometimes we like to keep one foot in and one foot out. And that doesn't work in the long term. What it does is it hampers your growth. It stymies your growth. It causes you certain conditions and degrees of backsliding and non-progress. And consequently, the term that is used in your Bible that Paul uses is you're grieving the Holy Spirit in you. You don't need to get rebaptized. You just need to recommit your life. You need to recommit your life draw the line in the sand and get back on track in doing what is needed to be done in order to activate that spirit to do what it should be doing in getting you to progress in forward motion. And he goes on, and he gets to this point where I'm going to finally introduce to you what I'm talking about. He says here in verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are not, uh, debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, for if we live after the flesh, you, you Christians in Rome, you Christians in Medina, if you live after the flesh, you baptize members of God's church because it's not once saved, always saved. So it goes to this point that you Christians, if indeed, he says here, for if we live after the flesh, you shall die. What are the wages of sin? Death. Romans 6, verse 23. Choose life, God says. Not death, not, Im, not eternal life in torture. It's just death. That's what it is. Eternal life in torture, being chased by demons in red stocking suits with sharp pitchforks, does not exist in your Bible. That's a myth. It's made up by religious, vain people that are basically providing fake news for all intents and purposes. He goes on here, for if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if through the Spirit do kill, mortify, eliminate the deeds of the body, and that doesn't mean, you know, that he's figuratively speaking here about those things that are counterintuitive to breaking God's law. That's what he's talking about, being that kind of fleshy driven, materialistically driven to where you are doing things that are not uh, in concert with what God and in harmony with what God is expecting of you. And that's what he's talking about here. He says, but if you through the Spirit do mortify, kill the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That is a major statement, brethren. And it is a major clue on how we can stay on track to be sure that the spirit and the attitude and the outlook and the personality does indeed develop into the kinds of kings and priests that God is nurturing us to become in his millennial kingdom. Remember, God does not want dictators. He does not want autocrats. He does not want insensitive people. He does not want rebellious people. He does not want people who will insist on doing things on their terms and not his. Even when they know better, even when they know what God is expecting of them, they still insist on going in their direction. No, no. What God is looking for is cooperative, conceded, that is, concession, not conceded egotistically, but conceded. You're con you concede to God's leadership. And the key here is what Paul says in verse 14. Let me reiterate. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So, my SPS, my specific purpose statement, what I'm talking about today leads me to this question. How can we be sure we're led by God's Spirit? Especially in light of this scripture. It's a very logical statement. It takes us to this question. All right, Paul, I hear you. How can I be assured? What is it that you're telling me? 
How can I clarify this? Let's go over to where we know the fruits of the Spirit are indeed outlined for us in Galatians chapter 5. And I'm going to break into the context for the sake of time and essentially go through this real quickly here, brethren. Verse 13, chapter 5, book of Galatians. Brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And we know that this is basically, for all intents and purposes, we're told is the royal law. In the book of James, Jesus' half-brother, he lays that out for us, that this is the royal law. You treat others as you yourself would want to be treated. And we can read that in James chapter 2, verse about 8 or so. Continuing on in verse 15, Galatians 5, But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk. And this word walk means to basically live like. It means to occupy oneself. It means to act like, to, to be in the, the illustration of. I don't know how else, how else I could describe it, but it, it's talking about walking this way. You know, not just talking this way, but walking this way. We often hear the fact that, well, we're just here warming seats in the church. There are people like that. You know, they come to church and they just warm a seat. They don't make any commitments to this way of life. They just, they come and they think, I guess, you know, that for all intents and purposes, if they're here, uh, that eventually they'll get resurrected and be in God's kingdom because they attended church or they paid their tithes or they went to all the holy days or they kept the Sabbaths. But brethren, no. God wants far more than that. Those are just uh, prerequisites. Those are just automatic behavioral recognitions that one comes to when one is led of the Spirit to recognize what Christ exemplified so that we might mimic that template. And that is the template. Jesus' life. It's almost as though, you know, God gave the law to Israel back in the Old Testament, and then he gave us Jesus, and he said, watch my lips. <laughs> you know, he gave us a real example to follow on how the law of God is manifest in the flesh and how it ought to live and behave and work and act in many, many situations, in many, many varieties and degrees of conditions. And we read that throughout the course of the Gospels as well as uh, the uh, expounded and enlarged uh, commentary of the apostles in their epistles and, and other additional books. But here in dropping down now to um, verse 22, we read the listing of these fruits. And in verse 23, we read the last two, meekness and temperance, against such there is no law. And we continue to read here, they, in verse 24, that our Christs have crucified the flesh with the affections thereof. And so here again, we, we see that Paul is basically telling us the same thing as he talked about over there in Romans 8, but with a little different twist and with more specifics. Because what he's talking about, let me reread 24, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections or the passions and lusts. What's he talking about? Well, he's referencing verses 17 through about 21. I'm not going to go, I don't have the time right to go through all of that, uh, but you can read it at your own leisure. But those are the passions of the lusts he's talking about that we need to eschew, that we need to avoid that we need to steer clear because it is these attributes, those characteristics that fight, conflict, and hammer us and prevent us, tackle us, stop us, restrain us, impinge on us from making the progress in our spiritual development. In our spiritual development. So Paul is saying here in verse 25, if you live in the Spirit... If you get rid of those things, 17 through 21, if you live in the Spirit, because that will be the result, if you eliminate 17 through 21, you'll be living in the Spirit. And guess what that means? Back to Romans 8, what that means is you're being led by the Spirit. 
And what is being led by the Spirit? It's described there in verses 22 and 23. Verses 22 and 23. He says here in verse 25, let me just finish this, if we live in the Spirit, then let us also walk in the Spirit. And how do we walk in the Spirit? What's the fruit? Here's the fruit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. That is a big psychological menu. That is a very big pill to swallow. These descriptions, brethren, when you take the time to dissect them, and that's what we're going to do, we're going to go through some of these in detail. And I'd like all of us to compare how we're doing and where we might need. Not your neighbor, <laughs> not your minister. <laughs> I got my own problems. But, but, you know, for all intents and purposes, how are you doing as we compare and go through this exercise of love? And we're going to use the scriptures. I'm not going to use any outside books. I want to use the scriptures. I want you to get familiar with God's psychology. This is the best, I've often said, this is the best psychology book there has ever been written. It really is. And it's just a matter of getting familiar with it and understanding where to find the information you need to define certain characteristics that will help us along to become the kind of Christians and committed personalities we need to be to please our God. And what he's telling us through Paul is that an easy way to assure yourself of being able to achieve what I expect, what God expects of us, is to allow yourself to be led by the Spirit. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? We just read them. Gen Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23. So, with the first one being love, let's go over here to 1 Corinthians, and what more appropriate place to launch this from would be 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We read this, we read this in wedding ceremonies, as though it pertains to a wedding. <laughs> Adrian Davis just did an Armor of God program. I don't know how many of you saw it or not, but uh, basically he goes through this and claims how much it is a myth that we always identify this with marriage. We need to identify this with life and the things that we are dedicated to. We need to understand that this is expansive and takes into account more than just our mates. Oh, our mates are included. Our mates are included, without a doubt. But it goes beyond our own families. It goes beyond even our own friends. It goes to the stranger. It goes to the individual that you meet at the market or in the grocery store. These are the things that God is expecting of us to be able to develop as, and I'm going to say this, brethren, the Bible uses the word trial a lot. I've mentioned to you over the years, you know, I was told never to say problems are a problem, that they're a challenge. <laughs> we have challenges, Bill. We don't have problems here. <laughs> we have challenges. But I've, I've gone beyond that now, as I've said before. I don't even look at challenges any longer as being challenges. I'm looking at now things that I get confronted with. This is just me. I'm just talking about me. But certainly, I, I would like to encourage all of us to learn or begin to learn. Change the psychology in your mind to look at your trials as opportunities. Opportunities. Opportunities for you, and you're going to see a lot of this through the course of the next multiple scriptures that we're going to be going through. Opportunities that will help aid you in your growth. In your growth toward achieving and accomplishing these spiritual milestones in your life 
and changing you from the hothead you might be, from the dirty mouth person you might be, to the dirty living person you may be, to changing and cleaning it up and saying, you know what, it's time I've got to change my lifestyle. I've got to do something more and get beyond this because maybe you're wrestling with something that you've been wrestling with far too long and it's time to really kick it in another gear and get out of it. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're told charity. Now this word is agape. And, and right off the bat, brethren, love, a lot of people say, well, you should change this word to love. Well, I've often said, too, that I get that and I understand that, but charity, I think, captures it even better because charity captures the action behind the agape, which is an affectionate, an affection for someone or something, a passion for someone or something. So there's an action implied by charity. Oh, I love you. That's so easy to say. It's almost cliche today. Because you know what? Love means a lot of different things to different people. There's a whole pornographic industry built on the word love. <laughs> it's the farthest thing from it. So agape, translated charity, I like. It suffers long. It's kind. It doesn't envy. As a matter of fact, you could almost, and you will get into this, see that you applaud the successes of others. Way to go, man, I'm happy for you. You, you did that? Holy smoke, man, that, that's great. Wonderful. Good job. We should become our biggest cheerleaders for each other. If one succeeds as the body of Christ, guess what? We all succeed in that respect. Theoretically speaking, that's the way it should be. As it is when we hurt and are physically down, we huddle and pull together and pray and do what we can to help others. And see, that's charity. That's an act of love. It's one thing to say, I love you, but it's another thing to follow up with an action that proves a care or that shows a concern, an activity, a sacrifice, some kind of a time that I spend doing something for you personally. That is a validation of when I say, you know what, I love you. I love you. Otherwise, you know, like I used to tell my girls, you probably hate to hear this, <laughs> You know, I used to tell them, don't tell me, show me. Don't tell me, show me. And that's so important because people are not defined by what they think. People are not defined by their good intentions. People are defined by what? By what they do. By what they do. And so charity, I believe, is a very fine word, very appropriate word. Charity envies not. Charity doesn't vaunt itself. It's not puffed up. It's, it doesn't blow its own horn, ring its own bell, cry from the housetops how great I am, look at me, you know, how, how lucky you are. We used to have a, a fellow in our congregation, Mr. Roy Brown, that passed away, really nice guy, <laughs> was in the Medina Bath congregation for many years, and he'd always come up to you and say, boy, it's so glad that you have the opportunity to meet me. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and uh, he, was, he was kind of a comical character, but uh, we loved him, and he had a heart of gold and was uh, really, really a fine, fine gentleman. But I always got a kick out of that where he'd say, boy, you don't know how lucky you are to know me. <laughs> yeah. But he said it in jest. He said it in, in fun, and uh, certainly it was uh, in some ways so comical. But at any rate, it goes on here, does not behave itself unseemingly, seeks not her own, not easily provoked, thinks no evil. You know, people think evil. You don't think evil. You cut them the benefit of the doubt, especially if they tell you something. If they tell you something, take them at their word. Don't in your heart think they're lying. Don't, don't process it in such a way that you will not give them that benefit of the doubt. Give them the benefit of the doubt. And if you don't and can't, ask them to verbalize it. That's what Matthew 18 is all about. 
going to your brother and talking and getting it out on the table. No, no elephants in the room, as they would say. He goes on here and he says, um, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in lawlessness or iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things, and endures all, long, all things. And then he goes on there in verse 13, the last verse here of this particular chapter, to put it in perspective by comparing the three very important uh, characteristics. He says, now abide in faith, hope, and charity. However, these three. But the greatest of these, he says, the greatest of these is agape, charity, love. The care and the concern, the affection, the passion that you have for something or someone without looking for reciprocal benefit. That's key. That's what charity means. You're giving without expecting back. Mr. Herbert Armstrong used to always have a saying, you know, most of us are centered around the way of get. Remember that? <laughs> the way of get. And we've got to train ourselves to like and become compatible with the way of give. And that means not giving to get. It means giving without the reciprocation or expected uh, reciprocal of benefiting from what um, we might get from giving. So this begins to lay some foundation here, brethren, of, of many of these uh, traits, these characteristics, these fruits of the Spirit of which is founded. It's founded on agape. We have to have affection for each other. We, we call our churches family, church families. Uh, I've heard people over and over tell me I'm so grateful, as in, in my travels, of having a church family. There are people on the Internet. I know that you tune into webcasting here in Medina or over in the home office in Tyler, Texas, and you feel a part of the congregation and that we become their church family even though they may be remote, thousands of miles away, maybe up in the mountains somewhere or wherever it may be, but the fact of it is because they begin to develop this, this familiarity with, with people. I, I've, had, I've been told to you know, keep the camera rolling so I can see the faces of who's, who's there after the program is over so that the people can you know, identify with, oh, there's so-and-so there. And, and I know the home office has uh, developed that kind of camaraderie uh, with uh, those that view the home office's uh, service as well. So it's important, brethren, that we have this sense of affection. And that's what I want to emphasize with this first characteristic, this first fruit of the Spirit, because we need to be led by that passion of love, first of all, of God. And then all those other things will fall in place. They really will. It's when we try to go outside of the boundaries of God's Word and we go over here or we go over there or we go over here and we get arrested or we catch a disease or we get in an accident because we shouldn't have been there anyway or we are here and something else happens and if we would have been here, guess what? We probably could have avoided those things. But because we don't control our lusts, our physical appetites, we ruin our lives so often and end up having to pay for it for many years going forward in one's life. So love, and certainly the love of God's way, is foundational to being led by God's Spirit. That's, that, you could say, is Rudolph's red nose. I mean, that there is in the vanguard. That there is the point on the spear. If you have no affection for God's Word to abide by it, a lot of these other fruits are going to be struggles. They are going to be struggles. If you have a deep, moving respect for God's Word and a passion to inculcate it, to embrace it, to have it a part of you, to define your personality then that will go a long way in helping you to accomplish and achieve the remaining characteristics that we're going to go through here. 
The next one is joy. Joy. Now, according to Webster, I had to look this up. You know, we, we hear a lot of things today. Joy to the world, girl, you know, and all that. Uh, we hear, oh, come all ye faithful. You know, I'm not going to sing it all, but we, a lot of time, this, this time of the season, allegedly, there's a lot of joy. It's also the time when most people get shot and killed. There's a lot of increase in, in uh, crime as well, stealing and, and all of that that uh, goes on. But the, pe- the point that I, I want to make is that joy is really a very interesting characteristic, and yet it seems to be rare now in, in many areas and in many cases. People are, are very, very intense today uh, for a lot of reasons and a lot of, uh, cons- because they have a lot of concerns. But here in uh, Webster's Dictionary, it says, it's the emotion that invokes or evokes by well-being, success, or good fortune, uh, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires, the expression or exhibition of such emotion. I like this next one, a state of happiness. Wow, a state of happiness. Taking time out to appreciate maybe what you have, to realize just how gay you are. I'm not allowing that word to be hijacked. You know what I mean. In the context of happiness. In the context of happiness. We are a happy people. Or we should be a happy people. And in all due respect to our way of life and what you know and the fact that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that the law has no demand on your life any longer, that you are actually on the road to life eternal in the kingdom of God at the time of Christ's return, I mean, that should be enough to make anybody just leap and jump for joy in realizing that your life now has been repaired. You are being redeemed. You are begotten of God and now are impregnated with His Holy Spirit, which means you're empowered to be led by the Spirit, assuming, of course, you're baptized. You're empowered to be led by the Spirit. However, God's not going to possess you. You know that as well as I do. God does not grab us by the ear all of a sudden and, whoa, whoa, what do you mean? You know, he doesn't do that. He wants you to be doing the things that you know you should be doing because you want to. That's the key. You come to Sabbath services not because you're coerced, not because the minister's chasing you down, asking you where you are. Don't you know you should be somewhere uh, in church more often or this and that? No, 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 no. We don't police our faith in the Church of God International, and frankly, we shouldn't be doing it in God's church anywhere. And if you're in that kind of environment, it's unhealthy. It's unhealthy. The reality of it is you should be obeying God's laws and trying to incorporate his values and embrace his standards because you want to and you know it is best for you. You do the things you do because you know God loves you and that if you follow this way, you're assured because it's God's way. If God is for you, who can be against you? Who can be against you? And we need to believe these things and allow these things to resonate in our spirit And then take the action to follow through with manifesting these behaviors so that we can truly be the beneficiaries for others to see God through you. Because guess what? You're also being trained to be intercessors. Kings and priests, intercessors for mankind to re-educate humanity on a whole new level. That's a big responsibility. And I'm not making it up. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, guess what? You're not going to heaven when you die. You're going to be going to the grave. You're going to sleep for a while. When Christ comes back, he's going to resurrect you and you're going to be kings and priests. Revelation 5, verse 10, on earth. Ruling from the Mount of Olives, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. All these scriptures. And you should know these things, brethren, so that you're grounded So when people come to you and they say this, that, or the other thing, you can show them the reason for the hope that's within you because each and every one of us ought to be qualified to be teachers in our own right. Oh, maybe we're not the most eloquent speakers. 
Maybe we, we sometimes get fuzzy about what we do believe, but perhaps that's due to the fact that we don't take enough time to study. We're watching too much TV or spending too much time on our iPads or our telephones. But in all due respect, we need to take time to Bible study so that we get these ideas and doctrines and teachings clarified in our minds so that we can put a couple of sentences together and explain <laughs> why I believe this <laughs> and why, uh, you know, the traditions of certain things are just, you know, they're off the rails. And so these things should make us happy and make us certainly filled with joy, and joy is a state of happiness. Over here in the book of James, chapter 1, book of James, chapter 1, and in verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall in different temptations. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. No, that's what he's saying. <laughs> he, that's what I mean. It's opportunity. That's why I'm saying we need to switch the gear here. We need to switch the switch. <laughs> it's, it's, it's opportunity. That's why we should count it all joy. It's oppor- wow, we got another lesson coming our way. Why, it's a new, new chapter. It's a new lesson to learn, (laughs) and we're going to push our way through this, and we're going to be better on the other side. You may say, well, Bill, you're really being a total optimistic. Yeah, call me that, but you're going to see that works in with another, another characteristic of this fruit of the Spirit. You're going to see that as we go forward in this, but for right now, in the book of James, we read this in verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into different temptations, knowing this that the trying of your faith works patience. Ah, patience. And let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect, complete, mature. You cannot mature. One of the most basic keys to success is patience. What did Jesus tell us? Possess your soul in patience. Why did he say that? Because that is one of the biggest, most fundamental basic, underlying, underpinning characteristics of success. Be patient. Don't jump off. Patience. Don't lose your temper. Patience. What does patience allow? Patience allows for communication. Patience allows for being able to talk. Because once we lose our tempers, and once we get out of that receiving mode, (laughs) it's no longer really a workable situation from that point on. So patience is important. And here we see uh, in this particular case, uh, James telling us very clearly that it's uh, critical in the development of this joy because joy does give us opportunity to develop patience. Philippians, over here, Philippians chapter 2. Let's go over there. Philippians chapter 2. And in verse breaking into the context, I'm just going to kind of proof text some of this to get to my points for the sake of time. But here in uh, chapter 2 and verse 17, yay! Yes, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and services of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. In other words, use me up. And if you use me up and I have to sacrifice some of the greatest things I have to say, I'm okay with that. That's Paul. I'm okay. Yeah, I'll come and get you, even though you're 250 miles away. Ah, no problem, you know. Whoa. Paul, he is... Just one dedicated guy. Uh, Go back up here just a few verses where he says uh, in verse 16, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice, happy, joyful, I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. That was his whole hope. That was his whole focus. He did not want to let God down. So if he could say yes to whatever he could say yes to, and you got to learn to say no as well. You can't overcommit yourself. But nevertheless, Paul here is trying to make the point in that we should be yes people. Yeah, we can do it. Can do people. That's what we should be as Christians. Yeah, we can do it. Not when I get around to it, but we can do it, you know. And he says here in this uh, case, yes, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy, I'm happy to do that and rejoice with you all for the same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me. And then he says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy uh, here shortly to all of you and he's going to even make you more happy. But point being that he's making here is that he's okay with whatever sacrifices that he's got to make because he knows that they appreciate it and that the service is not going to be done in vain. 
and that he has a mission to do that he doesn't want to let God down. Over here in 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And in verse 13. But rejoice. Let me go back up to 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Don't think this is strange that you are now being faced with a trial. Don't think it's strange that you have another opportunity for growth. Don't think it's strange, he says here, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. In other words, expect it. <laughs> Buckle up. You're in the greatest battle that ever was. And what's that battle? The battle against your nature. And guess what? If you had your way, you wouldn't change a thing, would you? Would I? Probably not. So what happens? we got to get motivated from time to time. And sometimes it comes from external sources, external opportunities, circumstances and conditions that drive us into certain modes of opera uh, operation that cause different attributes and conditions to be manifest from our own personalities that in some cases, brethren, if you're like me, didn't, you didn't even know you had the capability of doing that. And you surprise yourself in some cases, perhaps, from time to time. But he goes on here and he says, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Should it be any different for, with us? Christ suffered. No, that's the program. That when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad. That is, to be glad, happy, gay. Uh, you may have joy. That's what that's all about. That you may be joyful, rejoicing also with exceedingly, exceeding joy. And that's what he's saying here in this case. Over here to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I just want to go through some of these scriptures, brethren, because they're so important for all of us to become familiar with in regards to the ways that, uh, uh, insights that they give us to um, incorporate these fruits of the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and in verse 16. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing in everything. Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Psalms, over here in 47, uh, verse 1. Let's just go to the Old Testament for a moment. Psalms 47, and in verse uh, 1, we read, in this case, Clap your hands! I'm happy. Yeah, I'm happy. No, I'm not happy with that. <laughs> I'm happy, you know. <laughs> he says here, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is terrible. He's the great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under his and the nation under us, that is, and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loves. Selah! That's something. That's David. Happy. Dancing in his underwear. Happy. I mean, he was, he was one happy king. <laughs> and he had a lot to be thankful for. He had a wonderful kingdom he, for 40 years under his rule and reign and then 40 more years under his son Solomon. 80 years of affluence and wealth Israel enjoyed under the leadership of King David and Solomon. And then, of course, Rehoboam and Jeroboam in the divided kingdom. But those 80 years were wonderful years. Oh, they were hard years, especially as Solomon started winding things up and taxing all the people. But that's another story. The point, though, that I want to make is David was a happy king, and God gave him a lot of blessings in, in many respects uh, for his um, works, his ways. He called him a man after his own heart, regardless of his failings. But nevertheless, uh, as we all, none of us are perfect, but David had a good heart. David had a, a heart where he would take accountability for his mistakes. He would immediately fess up to the responsibility that he missed or that he wavered on. And he went to God and repented and accepted uh, that responsibility. And that's what God loved about him so much because he wouldn't argue. He would not argue. He would just accept his responsibility and take it and run with it. Isaiah chapter 12, real quickly here, verse 6 
cry out and shout, Thou inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of you. Great is God in you, brethren. Jesus Christ, God in you, crucified for you, allowing you now to be empowered with His Holy Spirit coming from the Father through Him so that you can have an intercessor that you can go boldly before the throne of God because He can be touched with everything that you're experiencing. Don't think for a moment He's insensitive, that He's not empathetic, because He is. He knows what we go through on this human level because He went through it. He went through it. He was betrayed, wasn't appreciated. People didn't like him. People yelled at him. They tried to stone him on a couple of occasions. Yes, he was a man who was well acquainted with a lot of negativism around him and things that were constantly trying him. So remember, as I said already in passing, if God is for us, brethren, if God is for us, who can be against us? Time has run out on me, so I guess you're just going to have to come back next Sabbath to hear the rest of this. <laughs> but uh, we're going to pick up uh, with peace and then move on to long-suffering and the remaining uh, attributes of this particular uh, presentation and uh, this section of Scripture in Galatians 5. So hope to see all of you back here at the same time uh, next week in Medina, Ohio at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Looks great. She is full of her normal spirit, uh, joy, probably, like Phil was talking about. She has a cast on, and they will be, let's see, they will be sending her to rehab for a while, but not sure how long it will be. So uh, thank you for your prayers for Jean Kirk, but continue to keep her in your prayers. Okay, brethren, uh, let's grab our hymnals, and we'll close out services on page 47. We will sing To Thee I Lift My Soul, page 4-7, and after which I'd like to ask Mr. Joey Gabriel to close with prayer.
we come before you at the close of this service, thanking you so much for the message we heard today, thanking you so much for the, the gift of your Holy Spirit, and uh, help us all to quench that, help it to grow inside of us to be the lights that this world sure desperately needs to see right now. Thank you so much we can come to you. Thank you so much for all that you do for us in our lives. and Help us to put the full body of armor on as we go into this upcoming week. Help us be your people. Thank you again so much for the truth that we all know, Father. Please be with us as we go on our travels and to our homes and bring us all back safe next week. Thank you again, Father, in Christ's holy and righteous name. Amen. Amen.